Well, I realize the title is What Every Art Teacher Ought to Know About Art Assessment, but my hope for the session and my goals for the session are that no matter what you're talking about, SGO, SLO, any other acronym such as that, um, this session will help you to write a good assessment question because one thing that I think we haven't covered today, we've been talking about what do I have to do, how do I do it, but you're out there in the field writing these assessments. You're actually writing an assessment. And are you assessment writers? No. no. So how do you know how to write the assessment to reach that goal, let alone decide what the goal should be, let alone decide what you're going to assess and get your curriculum. And so it all has to work together. So today, I'm not a student growth expert. I don't claim to be. I'm doing a lot of research right now because um, I want to provide some really solid samples for art teachers because one thing we haven't seen today is a good solid art sample on what a student growth should look like. And so. Um, the Art of Education is definitely working on that for you, and we have a lot of great uh, material coming up. But for now, I do know, and I have had a lot of training on writing good assessment questions, writing good student learning outcomes, and helping make it simple for you. Because I think we're all confused right now, and we just need to simplify and get to the core of this, and maybe have a few tips to take into our assessment writing when you're doing any type of assessment. So that's kind of the goal of this presentation, and please know that um, We'll try to make it a little fun and practical along the way because I'm still confused about everything else we've learned. But you know what? It's good. It's good. It's okay. And you know, here's my little uh, two cents about it all. I talked about this last night and I'll say it again. We have to play the game. We have to do this. It's not a choice. It's okay though because this little student growth portion that you're doing right now is only a tiny percentage of what you do as an art educator. And you can do it and you can make it as simple as possible and make it meaningful if you're lucky and if you're, and that would be the, my goal, make it meaningful. And then you can teach and do your thing. And it's okay. It's a tiny portion. It doesn't define you. It's not everything. And assessment can sometimes start to take over and we have to get back to why did we become an art teacher? and this is just part of what we do. So with that being said, as a disclaimer, um, I want to start with just talking about, before we talk about really specific assessment samples, I want to talk about curriculum because as we kind of have heard over the course of the day, without a solid curriculum, do you know what you're supposed to be teaching? It's hard to create an assessment because you should be assessing what your curriculum is. So here's how I think of arts assessment. Like an Oreo cookie, the top portion is your student learning outcomes, your student growth outcomes, your standards. Whatever it is, all it is is what do you want your students to know and be able to do by the end of art or the month or the year. The filling is what you do to get there, okay? It's your art project, your unit of study, your projects. And I pick that as the filling because the filling is my favorite part of an Oreo. I don't want anyone to tell me what I have to do for that art project. I'm the art expert. Don't say you have to do Van Gogh sunflowers for this particular standard. Let me pick the art that best fits this standard. So don't take away my filling. Let me do my thing. You know how to do your thing quite well. And then the bottom cookie wraps it all up and is your assessment. Now, the question is, are you assessing that project? Probably. Are you having an additional assessment after the project to see what they learned during the project? Perhaps. And I'd like to make a note that in some of my student growth research that I've already been doing, uh, student, it doesn't have to be pre and post, okay? You can have multiple points. Actually, good growth shows three or more data points to show the growth. So perhaps you have the pretest of your student learning outcome, you grade the art project, and then you have another little assessment afterwards that grades the same thing. The continuation of all these is that they can be graded on the same rubric. Okay, so I think that helps clarify a little bit. You have, you can give the assessment as many times as you need and you can do it in different ways, but it has to be graded on the same rubric to show true mirrored growth. It's called a mirrored assessment. A mirrored assessment assesses the same exact things in different ways, whether it's the project or a little uh, test or an activity that you give. So I want you to keep that in mind as well as I go through these samples. Here are some samples of student learning outcomes. Are these examples of student growth goals? Not necessarily, but student learning outcomes, SLOs or standards, can be tied to your student growth. 
what do you want your students to know and to be able to do? And how do you put that into words? What are the big things that, as someone said, I'd be embarrassed, as um, the speaker this afternoon said, I'd be embarrassed if my students didn't walk out of art knowing these things. And here are some examples of wording, because I'm going to show you how you can use verbs to create a better learning outcome, to write these standards so that they're more meaningful for the art room. And it gets you out of a multiple choice test, which I'll get to. So some samples could be, students will mix two tints and two shades to create monochromatic artwork. Just an example. Students will demonstrate accurate one-point perspective in a drawing. What does accurate one-point perspective look like? Your rubric or your checklist will define accuracy in one-point drawing. Does it have to have a vanishing point? Yes. Does it have to have this, a horizon line? And that's how you're grading that. Can you see how you could use that? Demonstrate accurate one-point perspective to do a pretest, an art project where they make a city, and then a mini assessment after that also could be graded using that same rubric. Okay? It can come full circle. Another could be students will use shapes to construct a composition and build recognizable forms. What's a recognizable form? Well, it's not just a collage. The student should be able to tell you. What is it? Is it a city? Is it a rocket ship? And is it recognizable? And what does that look like? Well, the rubric will help you see that. That one's a little bit more um, subjective, but you can see where it's going. Students will show 10 or more different values when drawing a still life. So maybe that's your focus, value. And you could really show growth with that, too, because you could start with students show two values. And, by, and then in the middle, they were getting five values. And they really refined it down to those 10 values by the end. So these are standards that you're assessing. They could also be subbed out for student growth, depending on how broad or specific you want to get. So how do you write a good student learning outcome or a standard or a student growth outcome? There are definitely better ways. First and foremost, you can take one concept in your art room, one simple concept, and by changing the verbiage, you can have a totally different type of assessment in art project. So in the first category, if you're focusing on the base knowledge, which is the biggest mistake that my art department made, we wrote everything the first year on a knowledge basis only, and we pigeonholed ourselves because we could only assess on the knowledge only, because our first standard was it based in knowledge. And so then, where was the creation there? Where was the art making? We weren't assessing what we were doing. That was a mistake. That was the biggest mistake we made. So here's, and I'll, tell, I'll walk you through that process so you don't have those same mistakes. The next is, so the knowledge example would be identify tints and shades in monochromatic artwork. Okay? Well, sure, many kids could just identify them. That's one part of what we do in the art room. Comprehension means they have to know what it is and be able to apply it um, and describe it and know more about it. Explain how to mix two tints and two shades to create monochromatic colors. So they not only have to have the base knowledge, but they have a process. I like process-oriented questions. I think they're really valuable in the art room because if a student can describe that process back to you, it means that they had a meaningful art experience and they can kind of come back with it. And then the best category, and this is, you can use Bloom's tax taxonomy to get into some of these verbiages too, and I'll give more verb examples after this, is the application. Students will mix two tints and two shades to create monochromatic artwork. So that's what we're really doing in the art project, right? The students are mixing. But the biggest question I get is, okay, so for the pretest, I have to get out the paints, and I have to have a mix, and then they have to do a project, then I have to mix again. That's practical. No, it's not very practical. And so how can we have practical assessments for some of those creation-based things without actually getting out the paints. Maybe this wouldn't be a good student growth goal to focus on, but it might be a nice assessment. You could even assess their knowledge of tints and shades after the project with a description or a process-oriented question. Are they mirrored assessments? Could they be assessed on the same rubric? Not necessarily, because they're in different cognitive demand. They're asking different cognitive demands of your students, and that's um, the hallmark of a good assessment when you're showing that growth is that you stay in the same cognitive demand. So if it's creation from the start, it's creation from the end. If it's a descriptor from the start, every time it's a descriptor. Or it's not a fair growth assessment because it is misleading. You can't assess a student on their knowledge and then their creation and expect that because you're not assessing the same thing. See where I'm at with the cognitive demand? So I want you to stay in the same column 
and if you stay there, you'll have a mirrored assessment. Here are some verbs you can use to help write your student learning outcomes, and these are just starters. You can think of many, many more to keep you going. Um, in the knowledge category, which there is a place for in the art room, some things you just need a quick, do they know the primaries and secondary colors? Do they? And sometimes you want them to be able to mix them. So it's okay to use it, but the application is the richest, as we know, because that's what we do every day. So here are some knowledge verbs. You can read those. Define, match, list, label. Um, when you're differentiating assessments as well for your special needs students or your high flyers, instead of sometimes doing a process-oriented one, you can go down the verb um, column and have more of a matching maybe for your special needs student instead of the scripting. It's getting to the same standard, but it's doing, showing you in a different way to help differentiate. So it's, that's also good for this. Um, comprehension, discuss, explain, give examples, summarize, predict. And then the application, of course, and these words are really powerful when you're writing your student learning outcomes. Demonstrate, produce, draw, create, mix, design. And someone said to me, mix, design, are those online for Bloom's taxonomy? I said, no, but are they verbs and do you do them in the art room? Yeah, so let's assess that part because that's what we're really looking at for the student. So this is kind of a little word bank to help you. Um, I also forgot this part, but if you haven't signed up at any of my other presentations or at, at our booth. Um, I'm going to send around the iPad and I'm going to have you um, put in your email and I'll send all this to you as slides and you can get all the examples with links and such. If you have done it once, you will get every single handout from all my presentations. So, okay. So the three keys to writing an effective SLO or student growth or however you want to um, define it is number one, choose your verb. What cognitive level of demand are you choosing to stay in and stay there when you do it? Is it going to be the comprehension, the application? Then number two, tie in your content. Are you assessing, and we talked a lot about what should we assess? Should we assess art history, a cultural connection, an art element of design? What exactly should we be assessing? And that's the hardest part, I think. What would make the best goal? Would it be an element or principle? Would it be the student's ability to critique, to write about their art, to um, talk about their art? And that is so personal. Like um, we heard this afternoon, it is personal. But you know your students, you know what you really want to focus on and what are the biggest things you want to focus on. So once you've picked your level of cognitive demand, you pick a little bit of your content, and then think about what might your assessment look like. Because this is just before you do the art project. What am I going to do with my students? But think about your assessment. Okay, can I assess this easily, quickly, effectively? And is it the data I want to get out? And so that... Um, Sometimes you're assessing the actual project. Sometimes you're assessing with an additional assessment that's independent of the project. Sometimes you're doing both. And it's OK. That's, it just depends upon what it is. Like with the color mixing, you may not be getting out the paints. But as long as they're still in the same level of demand, you can assess that thing multiple ways. And here is a grid that you can get in the handouts. And I know it's hard to read here. But what my art department did is we narrowed down and we had to come to an agreement, which wasn't easy, and there were, may, have, may or may not have been some arguments along the way, but we agreed on what are the big things a kindergarten student should walk away from our, pro, our program knowing and are able to do. And then we got to the how to assess it, which I'm gonna go through our entire assessment process with you after this. I just wanted to see how we got to the curriculum standards that we started with in order to know what to assess. You can see there were only three in kindergarten. That's reasonable, that's manageable. Trimester one, we were only focusing on students will produce six different line types. Simple enough, right? And you could even start with the pretest, and maybe they only showed one or two. You could do interim, they showed three to four. There's a rubric I'll show you that goes with it. And then the ultimate goal is six distinctive different line types. Are they in a drawing? Are they in a composition? That's a little higher demand, maybe. Or maybe they're just part of a design or part of a house or part inside of something. Um, so that's kind of where we went with it. What are the very basic things that your students will walk away from? Do you teach other things in trimester one besides line to kindergarten? Yes, 
Of course. If you don't, it would be the most boring art curriculum I ever heard. Because I wouldn't have written it on the elements and principles. I would have done something more bigger picture, art history based. But I was in a group, and we had to come to a consensus. Did I sacrifice my other fun things for it? No. I just include some of these with other things. But it was a nice baseline for me. Here's the kicker. These things were required of us to do. We could teach other things, but the only thing that we assessed were these. You don't assess everything you teach. You know this. But I think that's the message that we're missing with some of the student growth talk. How do I assess it all? How do I assess how students can make art and, and feel about art and talk about their art and put together art and composition and whoa, I think it's way too much. It, getting specific helps me to simplify this process. Getting specific. I'm only looking at line types. That's all I'm going to assess and the rest is just beautiful. You know, I mean, the rest is what we do. Think about the math teacher. Do they assess every single thing they do in math with their students all the time? No. The most important concepts are on that test. Same with art. So that's where you kind of start to get the definitions out there. So here is how we would assess an art project. So the standard was students will draw various line types to create a composition. This was up from, this was the first grade. The kindergarten was create six line types. The next will various line types to create a composition. And so we made a simple checklist. Did the student have six or more in the composition? And was it a composition of something? Yes, then they scored a three or a four. Next, did the student, if they only produced five or four, then they would get a two. Was it one to two? They got a one. Simple group, how simple is that? It doesn't get much more simple than that. But does it prove the goal? Could it show growth? Could it show the assessment? And is it simple and is it quick for those really young kids? Yeah, it works. Starting place. So we would use this to grade the actual artwork. And then we'd have another assessment after to kind of reaffirm. Because here's the deal with assessment. A true assessment should be independent of your instruction. It's what students know and are able to do without your help, because that's why it's called an assessment. And that's hard to wrap our mind around, because we can assess a lot of other things. But if you're getting data that's really important, you were there in the project to help the student. You guided them. You said, why don't you put this here? You should add another line. You should. I mean, that's the point. It's called teaching. <laughs> we help our students. But then to do something after shows you what they really retained from that. Were they looking at their neighbor? Were they just copying my example? And so having that extra thing after the project, I think, is kind of a huge hassle in our minds. But it's also important. And so I'm going to show you how to write some quick little assessments to go after your projects that still are the same level of cognitive demand. So let's get to the assessment piece. My art department created this beautiful curriculum. We were all on the same page. We had rubrics that helped us grade those standards in the art projects. And then we were told, and of course, like you, you must have an assessment to go with this. Yeah, you're teaching these things, but how do you know your students know it without your help? Fair enough. We get it. We need to do this. It's part of life as an art teacher. So then they said to us, and I, I mentioned this yesterday if anyone was there, they said to us, well, you have a half day, and you are going to sit down and create PowerPoints with A, B, C, multiple choice tests for K uh, 2 through 5th, and you have an afternoon to do it, and we'll implement it next year as a pre and post test. Go! And we were all just like, you got to be kidding me, right? This is insane. And so we just wrote out these really horrible tests. And there is a place for multiple choice, but man, I didn't, we didn't feel right about being pigeonholed into this. And some awesome guru at the district office said to us, um, A is yes, B is no, and C, you just put can't tell. Every single second grader, can't tell, can't tell, can't tell. You know, it was just kind of a joke. But did it tell us they knew the knowledge? Yes. But were they ever, they were making a project about symmetry during the year, and the assessment was about their knowledge of the art vocabulary of symmetry. It was different levels of cognitive demand. My assessment didn't match the art project I was doing, and the last assessment didn't match the art project I was doing. Do you see how that is? Do you see the difference there? If you were only required to show students knowledge about symmetry, then that's all you do all year. But you're not. They're demonstrating symmetry and their knowledge of it. That's a higher order thinking. And so we have to stay there. Did someone have a question? Yeah. Uh, not to throw things off, but the state guy that spoke earlier said that your final assessment could be their final product. Yes, he did, and I was in that session. And I don't think that's wrong, and I'm not the authority on this. 
I just know what I know from the assessment training that I've had based upon a true, what a true assessment is. But I don't think that he's wrong in that. I'm just saying if you really want to know what your students can do without your help, uh, extra assessment might be necessary. Or another growth point. Think of it as that. They grew because you helped them. How did they grow again doing it on their own? Something in that regard. So it doesn't have to look the same. I'm not suggesting you have these three assessments. I'm suggesting it could be one point in your assessment journey. Grading the artwork could be your end point. Sure. Are pulling pieces that already exist from some company that they use. Sure. So I'm, I'm just, and I'm, I, I appreciate all your information. Sure. I'm just asking. Apps. One substitute for another, or do we really need, because I'm working alone. Yep. And then I'm making up another assessment on my own. I think, as he said, your artwork could be the final piece of assessment in the journey. Absolutely. Um, I think the key is that you have multiple data points to show growth and that you're staying in the same cognitive demand in each of those assessments and you can grade them with a similar rubric because you can't show growth if you're trying to show, grade different things. So if your ending point is that final piece of artwork and you have enough data before that to show the growth that's leading up to it and that's your final, beautiful. If you need another data point and you want to go deeper into it and see, have that third or that fourth, great. It's, it depends upon the project. Does that help a little bit? Yes, but you mentioned that uh, the part I'm a little confused about because, again, seeing almost 600 students, mm -hmm. um, I want to be able to focus on what we do in class, not me checking off rubrics. If I were to use students' final projects for whatever is the SGO, does that mean I have to go through them again and check off on some kind of rubric where where they ended up? I was, was going to say it's just they can do the rubric themselves. You can hand it to them and let them self-assess it. Like when you're doing the critique, if you do critique, if you have, you can give them the paper rubric and really it's the, the three questions of kindergarten. Did you have six lines? Yes. Check. Did you? No. Yeah. Susan has something to add. Susan, do you want to add? There you go, I like that. So I'm just saying, like, you don't have to do this for 600 kids. You, and then they basically told us that they wanted to whittle it down more to get just the kids who need to show improvement. Then pick a smaller subset of that class. So it could be five kids who you're looking to improve. Yep, that's so exactly, saying, that's what I heard. Don't yep. Don't kill yourself with 600. Don't, don't try to even do that. They, they're looking for one, you can give two different SGOs and one and Agreed. I think we had some good info from the state today on what is actually required versus, and you have some good advocacy now to go back and information to go back to your administrator and create. And my big thing is create a proposal. Create your own assessment. Make it. Give it a try. Say, I have a better solution that I think would show better growth with my students. Here's a proposal I put together, a sample assessment, and my assessment plan for the year. Take a look. Do you still feel the need that I need to do 6th, 7th, and 8th all together? Or can I just, I propose 
in my plan that I just focus on one section of sixth grade. How will that be? I'm so excited to see this growth and it's going to be fabulous. You know, I got it. If you come to the table prepared, you're advocating for yourself, you have information to lead you, and you have samples, remember, they don't sometimes know what to deal, do with us. Nobody has time to write an art sample. No one has written one yet. I have yet to see a good one. I'm working on writing some right now, but man, is it hard. <laughs> man, is it hard. And so if you can do your best to present that, I just can't imagine saying no when you have the state of New Jersey's website pulled up with the actual requirements. But no one wants to write it for you because no one knows art like you. So there would be kind of my suggestion on that. Um, but with this bubble test, then back to this, which is okay, but I think we all want to get a little more performance based. So we had this Scantron and we had to give it to the second graders and they walked in on the first day of art and they had this little bubble sheet with a hundred bubbles even though there was only ten questions and they were like, uh, what do we do with this? We didn't realize state testing in the state of Iowa doesn't start till third grade. And so we, the art teachers, were the first people to administer a bubble test to our students. We had to show them how to fill in the little bubble. It killed my heart because they just came into art and they were so excited and they were so um, ready to go and, and they wanted to make something and it's art class and this is my saving grace, it's the best part of my day and you're going to fill in a bubble and take a test. And they just put C for can't tell for all of them anyway. And it was just, did we get a little growth out of it? Sure. Did the students learn something that year? Did we see some growth from pre and post? Sure. Was it the best assessment? No. So our mission in life that year in our art department was to research, research, research. Okay, we know multiple choice is one type of assessment we can give in the art room, but are there better types of assessments we could give for art? Can we write better assessment questions? What does assess more um, creative-based outcomes? And so this set on a search, and I've compiled all of this information in various ways throughout classes I've created, articles, PDFs, downloads, and I tried to link you up with some of them in the handouts. But all this information was very powerful. And what it told us is there is better assessments in the arts. There are. They exist. And a bubble isn't the only way. Do I still think multiple choice is a bad type of assessment? I don't. Because sometimes you do need a quick, easy, effective way to know what your students know. Are there better ways to write multiple choice questions? There are. There are ways to make them more higher order and make them a little more deeper in thought, and that's a whole other topic. But FYI, they're okay, but they're not the end all be all. So based upon this research, we came up with what we feel and whether you're writing assessment for student growth, for your classroom, for anything. The three keys to a good art assessment. Number one, fast to take and fast to grade. Assessment projects that take a month long are crazy. I've seen a district do it. Assessment projects, assessments that take even a class period. I know I saw my students so little. I didn't want to take that art making time away from them. Now if your art project is the assessment, that's a kind of a different story, but your pre I mean something you have to be doing before. You have to be doing a pre. So fast to take faster because you don't have time either. You have to go, and like she's saying, I'm gonna go through the pile of artwork and I'm actually going to assess all of this. Um, yeah, if you're doing growth on all those students you are, you do have to go through each piece. So what can you make it easier for yourself? Key number two, simple, make it short and sweet. You're only assessing the very most important concept that you were after when you sought out to do this assessment. Keep it there. You're not worried about craftsmanship. You're not worried about these other things in that assessment. It's just your learning objective or your standard that you have sought out to, to learn more about. And key number three, relevant, and which I just said actually, only assess the most important concepts. So keeping it in that will keep it manageable and keep us sane. Remember, we're playing the game. If we can get in and get out and do this, we can teach art. And it's not that all of it can't come encompassing, but it's going to be really hard the first year to find that perfect assessment that does it all. I haven't found it yet. I've just found better assessments. So creating a balanced assessment, in my research, one of the better examples I found is the NAEP. It's the National Assessment um, can't even read that right now because it's kind of long. The Educational Progress. 
And they have a big test that they give out in the arts, and their samples were really fabulous because they actually had three components to them, which I felt was quite manageable for art teachers. A performance aspect, there was a constructed response, which is that describing your process, and a multiple choice. So if you're just assessing a plain old, your art program, forget about student growth for a second, you could get multiple angles on what students learned about a, a concept by choosing different ways to assess them. And this is what I feel is a really balanced assessment. If you wanted to stick with your student growth, you could stick with one of these categories as long as you stay there. Am I assessing students' ability to describe their artwork? I stay in constructed response the whole time. Am I assessing their performance, creating something? I'm staying in performance the whole time. And some of you I know are doing multiple choice student growth tests. I know you are, you've told me. Your district said you had to. So you stay there and we'll work on it. We'll make a better assessment question. And here are some samples that I'd like to share that come into each of those categories. So the first multiple choice assessment sample is look at the clay on display. Which of these is a coil pot circle your answer? It's identification, but again, for those clay concepts, man, are you really gonna get back out the clay and have them do it three or four times, the same thing? I didn't, I didn't have time for that. Sometimes it's okay to assess something using multiple choice that's a little more messy or hands-on. Um, which artist's work best represents Impressionism? That is a higher order multiple choice question because it, not, it implies that they already know what Impressionism is and they know how it has to look embodied in a piece of art. And so that gets to many things you taught and it's one quick question. Some constructed response questions, and the landscape is one of my favorite, and I think it could be a good takeaway for you. Look at the landscape. Draw a tree in the background, a house in the middle ground, and a flower in the foreground. Okay, so they're actually doing a mini performance there. Sorry, I'm doing performance right now in the middle. They're actually drawing it as if as they did in their art project. It mirrors what you had students do in that project in a mini performance way. So it's another way to gather that data without doing another whole art project. Because that was my question in all of it. I mean, how many art projects of self-portraits do I have to do throughout the year? How burnt out are the kids gonna get to get many data points? So maybe one's a big project and one's a mini short performance that still can be graded with the same rubric. Do you see where I'm going with it? And then the constructed response would be um, just some of your little quick questions. Uh, I can't read those and I don't have them memorized, but. Um, explain the process an artist might use to create a collage. There's that process. If you taught collage, if students created one, they should be able to describe the process in detail. How do you know the process is correct? Well, you have a rubric that says, you know, maybe the collage isn't the best example. You have a rubric that says the process of a collage. If they start saying, well, I start painting and then I just hang it on the drying rack, that's not a collage. You know, it's combining different elements together. So these are kind of some little mini, and they don't look like tests. It's not a Scantron sheet, it's not a bubble sheet. It looks like an activity. And why do we have to call it a test? It's just a um, mini celebration of knowledge or a little quick little activity we're going to do. And it looks like a worksheet and it looks kind of fun, but it's telling you a lot. So what we decided to do, and this is independent again of the student growth, but for assessing our whole art program and our standards, because our goal was to assess the standards we taught. How can we prove to administration we had to have data that we had taught concepts and students had learned them. Pretty simple. We came up with this long sheet on the ledger size paper and what it was divided into trimesters. First trimester, we had the two concepts that we worked on in the fir first trimester with our second graders. And the students would fold it back and they would, at the end of the first trimester, they would just complete these two little activities. Complete the butterfly using bilateral symmetry, draw an organic shape, draw a geometric shape. Boom. You know, that was performance, it matched what they'd done in their artwork, and it showed us each little mini assessment related back to one standard that we were required to teach and assess. Only those things. It had a stand, one standard related, and that was it. That's how simple it was. Second trimester at the end, we folded back the paper, and students completed the next two questions. Third trimester, the last. At the end of the year, we had one long sheet with a student showing performance on all the standards, plus the artwork that we had to supplement this. So this was in addition to the artwork, but it was another way to glean that data on those same exact concepts. And um, it worked really well for us to assess our art program, 
And I know that they've now moved to doing some booklets as well with more questions and that can be kept. This wasn't sent home with the students. This was program data for us to know how we were doing teaching. Is our fourth grade curriculum too hard? What do we need to tweak for next year? I get that that's not the same group of students, but it's other good data that you could get about your curriculum and your art program. Could this be given as a pre and a post? It sure could. And then we have the scoring, which is something I haven't heard many people mention today as well. How do you score a performance-based assessment? How do you make sure it's fair, not subjective? Is a rubric the only thing that saves us from that? Not always. Rubrics are great, but there's a lot of questions on a rubric. You, you make a simple rubric and there's a lot of gray area. And so what we did in our art department was, first of all, we made our checklist. What are we looking for? Create a drawing using one point perspective. If a student had a three, they had to have the following things included. They had to have a square drawn, which was part of the directions, two to three orthogonal lines. They had to have a back line, back lines of the cube, and then they had to have them going to the vanishing point, I believe. Yeah, parallel lines, okay. So we had sat down as an art department and we each graded our own. Okay, we each graded our own students. Then we brought it to the table and we brought any ones we had in question to the round table in our PLC. And we said, okay, I see this, but do they really have the vanishing point correct? And is this really, I mean, I think it's a gray area. What would you give? Would you give this a two? Would you give this a three? And we brought our question, it's called inter-rater reliability. You have another professional coming in and giving you um, suggestions on how you're grading that assessment in order to make sure you're being accurate. And so we did that inner rater reliability and we had sticky notes and you would put what you would have given it on. Pass it, don't talk to anybody, put what you would have given it on. And then we kind of would talk it out as a group at the end. It was really powerful because we realized that even though the rubric was strong, there were gray areas and we kind of got to the bottom of that. How can we make it even more clear for students? And how can we make this more clear for ourselves? Because just because you have an assessment doesn't mean it's a good one at all. And so you can spend years giving bad assessments, getting bad data that doesn't get to the core of what you're doing. And so we really wanted to make sure these questions were good too. And we used this process to revamp our assessments for the next year to make them better. And we had a whole grid then that we added up the totals and got some averages. So um, it was definitely a very valuable process to make sure the scoring was fair and accurate on performance-based objectives. And I just wanna say the importance of piloting. And I believe when we heard from our last speaker um, about what he was trying to say to you is don't do all 500 students. He was, he was using in another form the word piloting, which is a fun word to administration, not testing it out, trying it because I have no idea what I'm doing. Piloting sounds beautiful and wonderful. I have a pilot program in place. It, isn't this wonderful? And so I would suggest when at all possible, ask. Just ask, can I pilot this assessment with this second grade group. I have a plan in place, here's what I'd like to do, and I'm gonna try a pilot this semester. Next semester I might add third grade into it because I feel comfortable and I've piloted it. And so I think that that word can help you to advocate when you're going back to your administrator who's saying, no, we're doing it this way, but I'm art. And I always think about this. The, if you're elementary, and this is how it was with us, the amount of time I saw my students in the whole year equated to the time the classroom teacher saw the student in one week. Wrap your head around that. The time I saw the students in one year was the same as the classroom teacher in one week. Why are we, if they're assessing 26 students in their classroom, why should you have to assess any more than 26 students? Why are you assessing 126 or even 226 or more? So it's, it's about the ratios in the end of the day. And the ratios tell us that we need a sampling. We need to pilot because we can't get good data if we're just do, trying to do it all. You can't. How can you go deeper into any of this? How can you get deep and really look at that piece of art and get to the core of our students learning? How am I moving them forward and how to care? If you're doing anything too spread out, we're not gonna do it quality. So really drive that home and use the word piloting. I think it'll help you. And last but not least, once you have your data, and I have some examples along the side there of something we called anchors. Um, 
we would create anchor pieces for what a three looked like. Put them in a PowerPoint, take photos. What a two looks like, put them in a PowerPoint, take photos. And it was a visual rubric that we could pull out and show parents if they questioned our grading. We could use for other assessments and, and build on throughout the year. They're called anchor pieces. So that is definitely another thing you could do as you're forming your assessments, as you get some good student samples, as you're writing your student growth goals. Take documentation of your anchor pieces so that you can do a better, even better job next time. But the biggest mistake I think teachers make, even art teachers, is we work so hard to get the right assessment in place. We work so hard to administer it with um, fidelity. We work so hard to get that last data. We have the data and we just hand it in because somebody needs it by December 15th or whatever it is, you know. And we just let it go because we have to sometimes. But what else could have I done with that data to advocate for my program? I had to do the data. It wasn't a choice. But can I do something more with that data to gain the respect in the profession? Because we know as art educators, it's an uphill battle every single day. No one gives us the respect we give each other in this room. We are on a different playing field because we have that background knowledge. So the simplest of things, you think you're, maybe your community doesn't care how students did in art or how they grew in art? They probably do. And they might be surprised to know that art even gives an assessment because half the population thinks you're just finger painting in art. They really do. So you need to use your data as advocacy no matter what kind of data you're getting. And some ways to do that is share with your administration, schedule a meeting. And that's what I did when I had that new assessment proposal. I said, I'd like to schedule a meeting. I have a proposal for a better assessment plan. And my assessment PDF crashed all their computers, which made a statement because they were like, whoa, she means business. And I came in and I said, here's the implementation plan. Here are the dates I'd like to do it. Here is this. And they took me really seriously. By the end of the meeting, they were like, okay, Jessica, whatever. You can do your new assessments. Like, they didn't want to deal with me. But I came so overprepared that no one could say no. They could have, but they didn't. And so that I won in the, in, in the end, you know, and our art department won. And the biggest thing is the students won because they were not being, they were being assessed in a more traditional way for the arts. Um, presented a PTO meeting. Maybe every October you go see your PTO and present some data, any little nugget of data, what you're doing. It's not just about the art and the finished pieces in the hallway. Um, go to your local school board meeting, write an article in the local newspaper, post on your school website or blog. You may think it's boring, but the numbers and data do speak, especially when parents are the ones who back us more than anyone else. If you can get the parents on your side, the, the parents have a lot of pull with the administration more than you do. So you kind of can go around that way. And make everything you do get noticed, whether you wanted to do it or not. Make what you do get noticed because there's so much good in it, or you will take the risk of becoming irreplaceable. And you need to become... Um, more visible in the community in order to get that advocacy out there and to get that respect because you're doing the awesome things. So get it out there and advocate for your art program and data is a great way to do it along with all the other things you're doing. So I know I didn't solve the problem today of how to write an amazing student growth goal but I'm working on that and I, I will promise you today in this room that I will find some great samples and I will write them myself and I have been actually in meetings with some of the best student growth gurus in the country who are doing this for their living and I have been in tons of meetings with them and I have lots of good stuff. And I'm going to share it with you because somebody has to look out for the art teachers because again, we haven't seen a sample. And so I'm working on it and we're, um, please just keep updated with the Art of Ed because we are going to be helping get the mystery and the myths out of this and just help simplify it down. So you can get back to doing what you do best and that's teach art. So please stay in touch and we will be, um, rolling out new things all the time. And I'd love to connect with you, so um, definitely come after and ask me any questions you have. Hopefully this was helpful in general assessment and you have some more thoughts about some samples. So I'd love to hear your feedback and input and um, now I promise there's no more assessment, assessment sessions for the rest of the day, so <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thanks for coming. I'm so sorry that I never run out.